See Beneath Your Beautiful podcast is raw and intimate, sometimes funny, and always entertaining. With new episodes every Saturday, Hara explores our love, fears, and hopes with a delicious combination of depth and lightness. Today, we interview Shashila. Shashila, will you introduce yourself and pronounce your last name? Sure. <laughs> um, my name is uh, Sushila Ramachandran. I practice as a sound healer and also a creative play facilitator. So that's what I do professionally. I'm someone who loves the arts. I'm all about intuition and spirituality. And I'm really here to create a world where we can really live in our highest expression of love. That's really what I'm here for. That's awesome. I love how we met that we were at a conference together. And I think you were in the row in front of me and you just turned around and you were friendly and you were talking to everybody and somehow we just became good friends. And I love that. (laughs) Yeah, that was so, I was just reflecting on that. Like I felt like the universe kind of brought us together multiple times because we met at the conference. We had a little chat and then we happened to be at the same event in LA. And then we went in another event in LA. (laughs) Like two weeks later. We're so fancy and hobnob in LA so often. Yeah, it was beautiful. I really feel like the universe orchestrated our connection. It's it's beautiful. Yeah. Definitely. Explain to me what a sound healer is and what did you say about play? What do you do? Yeah, so I'm a creative play facilitator. So I can start with um, sound healings. Last, well, 20, let's say 2020, I really found my voice um, as a singer. I've always, I used to sing a lot when I was young. I didn't really appreciate it, my talent at the time, but I was saying for a friend of mine when she was really upset and uh, she just looked at me and was like, oh my God, so she you have like a voice of an angel. Like you need to be on stage. You need to be recording albums. And I was like, what do you mean? But then I started sharing my voice with my friends and my family. And what they were reflecting back to me was that they experienced like a healing energy from me when I would sing. People have shared, oh, I had a headache and it's gone now. Or, oh, I'm getting these, I'm seeing colors or I was getting visions. And I was like, so there's something in this. My expression of sound healing is through my voice, which is my primary instrument, that I help people heal, that I help people calm their nervous systems down, release whatever just needs to be let go of so that they can be in their most aligned state. Do they come to you? Do you do it via Zoom? Do you record it so then they can play at any time? With the sound healing, um, right now it's through Zoom. Mm -hmm. People will come to me for a session and I'm going to begin recording so that people can just listen to it whenever they want. The play thing, is that something like what we did when you were doing your your Zoom sessions with all your friends? Like, remember those Zoom sessions? Yeah. So I'm a multi-gifted artist. I sing, dance, write, act, all of it. I also have a background and event planning and program management. And I'm also a coach, an intuitive coach. So I've blended all these, these different expressions of me together and have created these play experiences where basically through singing, dancing, writing, I help people to specifically women is who I'm focused on right now. I help women break through their voice and visibility block and skyrocket their business as well as their personal life. That's a creative play aspect. Yeah. That's really cool. What does it mean to be an intuitive coach? So we all have a sixth sense. We can call it our intuition. How I ex- describe our intuition is like, it's like this muscle that connects us with our deepest knowing, our deepest truth. And we all have access to this. What I do as an intuitive coach is I am access to the point where what I'm able to tap into what goes beyond the five senses about another human. So I can look at another human and basically name, you know, what their blocks might be, where they may be storing stuck energy in their body, what's going on in their subconscious mind, what their talents are, what their gifts are, but also what's been holding them back. And basically what I'm able to do is pull those out and help them know those things consciously so that they can begin transforming what's not working to really step into the full expression of 
of their gifts, of their talents and their voice in the world. So that's how I define an intuitive coach. Yeah. That's so cool. I don't remember when we were in LA. January, 2020. January, 2020. And it was for David Nagel, right? That's right. Yeah. We were at that seminar and I had just purchased my camera. I didn't know anything. And I asked if I could do a photo shoot of you. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of how many hours we shot, I erased the card, which was awesome. So I just love that you were there from the beginning. You might've been my first real photo shoot. Wow. I did not know that. And I didn't even know how to use my camera. Okay. The point of the whole of that whole conversation is we had a chat before we went to the photo shoot so I could get to know you better. Mm -hmm. And we talked about your mother. Yeah. And we are both motherless daughters. And I would really love to talk to you about that journey for you. And if you're willing to go, go there, whatever you want to talk about, about your mom and where you were and where you are now. Cause I think it's a big difference in this one year. Oh my God. Massive. Mm -hmm. It's actually really interesting. I find it so poignant that we're having this conversation today because I was actually at the ocean doing some releasing around some stuff around my mom. So I was like, (laughs) you know, synchronicity there. Yeah. My mother was, she was my she was my human. Like she was my person. She was my best friend. She was my rock. She was like the most important person to me in my world and my biggest champion. And so she was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, I think in like 2001, 2002. And she was very young. Um, I think she was kind of in her early forties. They had medication at the time that was able to kind of stave off the symptoms. And plus my mother is a, was, was, is, is a fighter. She's with me on the other side. So I'm going to say is. And she did acupuncture and all the things that she could possibly do to maintain her health. And so for the first, um, let's say 10 to 11 years of her diagnosis, like we didn't, I didn't really experience much of a difference in terms of my real connection with her because she was still working, still able to do everything. So I didn't really experience too much of a shift there. But in 2011, we started to really notice her symptoms and her disease because the medications will work to a point and then they'll kind of stop working. And that's what slowly started happening. She started deteriorating before our eyes. How old were you when that was starting to happen? I was 23. A big part of my life was being a caregiver. That was really difficult because I didn't know I was grieving at the time, but I was grieving in my own way. But really consciously, the grief hit me really hard when she actually passed. Because when you're, at least my experiences, when you're caregiving for someone, your mind, your body, your spirit is all about like, how do we make this work? And, you know, we're still doing all the things and also like taking care of the person. So it all becomes about the person's care really wasn't about so much about how I was feeling and what was actually going on. I didn't really have space to really acknowledge or feel what was really going on. I was also relatively young too, you know, just trying to figure myself out. But then in 2017, so this, so I was 29, April, 2017, she passed. And it's weird because none of us, we never talked about that part of her journey. I personally didn't see it coming. Like she was definitely deteriorating. When I look back now, I'm just like, yeah, she was really on the decline. But just the thought of her passing, I couldn't even really like allow myself to fathom that. The thought was like, okay, she's going through another, another dip. She will get through this too, because we had seen her go through so many dips and and still continue because my mom was a force. Yeah. My mom was dying for six months and they kept telling me she's dying. I just think you can't imagine a world without them. And so you can't fathom that they're really going to die. I can really relate to that for sure. And then when she died, she died in her sleep. So I'm really grateful that it wasn't painful because she had suffered a lot. Because at that point, she was pretty much immobile. She pretty she couldn't do anything on her own. That's where she was in her state. And she was also hallucinating a lot. Like she wasn't really conscious for a lot of the time. Was that because of the medicine? I think it's partially the medication and I think it's partially the Parkinson's. 
But yeah, so when she passed, the worst year of my life, and I've been through a lot, like I have been suicidal, I've experienced depression, I've seen and experienced a significant amount of trauma in my life. But this was one of the worst kinds of pain that I've ever experienced. I just remember feeling so lost and so untethered and and just in so much pain. I had so much grief because I think it was like because I wasn't consciously grieving in all those years when she was actually like really dying. All that grief was just like building up. And then it's like there was the grief of her passing. And then the grief of all the years of not having her. Mm -hmm. Byron Katie talks about helping her mother die and being really present. Mm -hmm. I wonder what it would be like to be really present now. Of course, you know, especially at 18, I was running away constantly. So I didn't have to experience whatever I was feeling. Yeah. I would love to have a redo and be present and acknowledge her dying. You know, like not be scared of somebody dying. Yeah. You said you were, you're not grieving during the time, but I don't know how you do unless you're totally like comfortable with the dying process. And and who is at a young age? No, we're not. And yeah, no one really prepares us for it. It doesn't really get spoken about, you know, like even as a society, how much do we talk about death? Like most of us, no matter what age you are, like we don't really talk about death. I interviewed Randy Johnson and she's a death doula. And I loved her conversation about how we just have to bring it out into the open and not be scared of death and dying. And she said, dying is not a failure to live. Oh, I love the new perspective, but I know it's hard as you're going through it and it's hard as a young person. Oh, for sure. I mean, I really felt like I had nothing stable in my life either. Like, everything was up in the air. I didn't know what I was doing career wise. I didn't know, like I I was in the midst of healing all my own personal trauma, like I'm doing deep, deep healing through that time. And then my center was not my center anymore. So, so many shifts were going on. And it's interesting you talk about presence because That was one of the big lessons for me, actually, because I also wasn't, I was relatively present in terms of caring, her caring, but I was also not in many ways because I didn't actually acknowledge what was really going on. And I think that was also part of my own coping, coping strategy. I think totally reasonable. I equated my mother with my sense of safety. I had a lot of my identity connected to her. After she passed, what it's really catalyzed for me is to really get to know who I am outside of my mother. Because I had experienced a lot of trauma and my mother was the person I felt safest with, like I depended emotionally so much on her encouragement, on her like validation, right? So to have that now gone, It's been this process of reclaiming all those things for myself to, for me to validate me, for me to trust me, for me to, you know, be my own space of love and nurturing and care versus needing to rely on another person to, to give that to me. It's been such an incredible unfolding. Like it's been really challenging, but also incredible. I mean, so much has shifted because of it. Because in a sense, my world was rocked. I almost had to re-examine all the foundations in which I created my life. It's like that chaos that gets created. And I feel like that chaos has inspired a new and a better order, a more stable order that's kind of free from the old programming that wasn't working for me. When I spoke to you in LA, you were still reeling, I would say, Mm -hmm. from the loss of your mom. Yeah. And you're in such a different place just a year and three months later. And so what would you offer somebody who has just lost a loved one? Do you have any words of advice or wisdom? Absolutely. Um, The first thing I want to say is I'm sorry for your loss. Mm -hmm. Do you think 
that is the only appropriate things to say. I do. I I do. I want to punch people in the face when they say they're in a better place. Oh my God. Yes. I am with you on that. I'm going to one day. (laughs) Empathy is exactly what's needed. I just remember when I was even at the funeral and and people would be like, she's in a better place now. And I just was like, not what a daughter wants to hear. I think people who say that have never lost somebody they love. I actually agree with that. Because you can't think that a better place is somewhere not in my world. Yeah. So that's the first thing. I'm sorry for your loss. Yeah. And I think having ritual is really important. There's a river near uh, my parents' house and I would go there every day and walk for an hour. That helped me so much. Having a self-care ritual that allows you to be nourished and also allowing yourself to feel, I think is really important. And I also want to say it's a very non-linear process. It's not going to make any sense. This is your unconscious mind. It's not something you can control. It's, it's part of being human. I read a while ago something about the grieving process and it's not something you get over. I'll always miss my mother. Mm-hmm. And I love that it sort of gave me permission to not be grieving, but to, to recognize that there is a loss. Mm. And I'm allowed to always want her in my life and remember her and to talk about her and to love her. Yes. I'm 53 and I was 18 when I lost her and I still want my mommy. Yeah. And someone told me this and it just brings me so much comfort. The depth of our grief is only really, I think, a testament to the depth of the, of the love we have for that being. Right. And so rather than kind of demonizing it in any way, you know, or, or wronging it in some way to actually recognize that it's another form of love. Right. And my mother was by no means perfect, but I always feel like I was unconditionally loved by her. And now you have to go out in the world and try to find that, which is never going to be repeated. Mm. You know, so I, the picture, it's so funny when I post a picture of my mom and me, I feel like, aha, see, I was unconditionally loved at one point. There's just this weird thing that if you have a mother, you're loved in the world. And I have talked to so many women actually who don't get along with their mother. Same. So Maybe it's not true. And I have, you know, my rosy colored glass on. So, you know, what I'm starting to do for myself is taking it as an invitation, like to yes, miss her and taking it as an invitation to unconditionally love myself. And that's been really, that's been so helpful in terms of my own, in terms of my own healing process. Yeah. Another thing that really helps us is I'm like 50% of me is her like literally her DNA is in my body. (laughs) Oh, I love that. I've never thought that. I really love that. What do you think? Do you have problems or get annoyed or anything when a friend of yours complains about their mother who is living? I actually don't. My relationship with my mother is going to be very different from their relationship for their mother. So I don't think it's fair for me to compare I wish it was different because they have their mom and they're wasting a minute, you know, because mm. someday they won't have their mother. I think there's truth to that as well. I'm also in a different sort of phase of life, too. I think because you've lived more years, this is something I've noticed with people of an older generation is I think you get better at just not focusing on the, the unimportant Whereas I think when we're in there still in our 20s and 30s, like it's still kind of like, we, I don't think we have that sage wisdom in our bodies yet. I totally get that. They used to say when I was younger, don't sweat the small stuff, but it's really true. And it really is all small stuff, but it's hard to acknowledge that. I get that. It all feels weighty. Do you worry about things that are out of your control? Um, like what will they say or what will they think? Oh, do you think that? Sometimes I can still be really self-conscious because I'm definitely a recovering people pleaser for sure. I'm so surprised because I have a very different vision of you. You seem very self-assured and you seem much more to me than me in tune with who you are. 
So you're giving off a, a good vibe, even if it's not true in your heart. I think we have both, right? Like we're all light and shadow, so they can both coexist. And I think when I'm with people, people bring the best out of me. Like I thrive in connection. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I'm connecting with someone, when I'm with a friend or, or just any person, it just brings out my light. And so now I'm learning how to, how to have that same light when I'm on my own, because all that shadowy stuff happens usually when I'm not, when I'm on my own. Um, so that's where I'm growing right now. I like that, you know, so much about shadow work and the light and the dark, and also about masculinity and femininity. and If somebody wanted to get more information, like how do I go about learning about those things? Like the masculine and feminine? Those things. And just like you're saying, the shadow self, like what do I, is there books or anything I can read to learn more about? What do you suggest? The first person that comes up is David Data. He wrote a book called Intimate Communion. And he talks a lot about the masculine, feminine within the context of relationships. But those principles are still relevant within ourselves and also how we show up in the world. Okay. And in terms of shadow work, um, there's a great book. It is a little bit of a denser read, but it's really good. It's called Meeting the Shadow. And it's written by a woman named Caroline Zweig. Her last name is like Z-W-E-I-G. Awesome. Thanks. I'm going to put them in my to-do list. (laughs) To read list. To read list. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever read Motherless Daughters? It's a really great book. It's just stories from women who have lost their mothers in every stage of their lives. One person, you know, they lost their mother in childbirth, so they never knew their mother. And one woman who lost their mother when she, the woman was 80. The mother was a hundred or whatever. Wow. What I remember about that book that was so comforting was it doesn't matter when you lose your mother, Mm. you're still a motherless daughter and you still want your mommy. I love that. Put that in my to reread list. Well, this has been just so lovely. You are lovely. As are you. I'm just always so happy for us to chat and connect. Me too. I love how the universe works because I can't believe We're friends. How would I even know you if I didn't go to that conference on a whim? I am a different person because of that conference. And I I love that you're part of that reason. Oh, thank you. I'm so grateful for so many of the women. One interesting thing since my mom passed is I am surrounded by women of all generations. And the women I have in my life, yourself included, are so generous and have just poured me with so much love and support. So so I'm really grateful for our connection too. And me too. This was so fun. It's actually really nice to to speak about this. It's interesting. Like I was at the ocean today and and one of the things I was really saying actually was anger because I was experiencing anger towards the fact that my mother died and didn't tell me. And I was like, oh my God, that's a thing. (laughs) What do you mean? Because I have a something like that. What do you mean that she didn't tell you? I don't know that I guess it was just, it felt really out of the blue. Like if there was this not feeling like she was, she prepared me for that. It was just really fascinating. Yeah. I have had dreams over the years where I'll find my mother and she'll be on a beach somewhere smoking a cigarette, drinking a glass of wine. And I'm like, oh my God, I have been looking for you. Whoa. And she's just like, well, so I feel this is so interesting because the reason that made me think that because I feel abandoned. Mm. She did not intentionally go away, but it feels like she did. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. How interesting. That's what I did at the ocean today. She just left. She just left and she didn't say anything. And and literally I was just crying and I was like, I forgive my mom for for leaving and not saying that, not saying goodbye. Ah, uh, that chokes me up. <laughs> I totally understand. And it's so interesting because they definitely didn't want to die. My mom had intended to live for a very long time. And she told me that too. So interesting that that's what we're left with is this feeling of abandonment and no goodbyes. Oh, I don't know if I told you this, but like he passed, I think the early morning of the 15th of April, 
So interestingly, I think like earlier in that week, my mom had asked her sister to come down from New York to stay with us for the Easter long weekend. And the evening before everybody came, me and my mom were just on our own. We were watching her show, Wheel of Fortune, because that's what she loved to watch. And just sort of out of the blue, she just looked at me and she was really conscious. And um, she just looked at me and she was like, I'm so sorry for what you and your dad are going through with me. And I walked over to her and I put my hand, arm around her and I just looked at her and I said, it's okay, mom. This is just God's plan for us. And we'll get through this together. Then she went back to her world of being hallucinated and, uh, and then she passed the next day. Like, I don't know, it was just really interesting that we had that moment. Yeah, it was really um, special. Mm-hmm. And it was so interesting because the next day, a couple of hours after we learned she'd passed, I felt her spirit come in like, like this. Yeah, I got a vision of her flying in the sky, smiling, which is great because she was trapped in her. She was literally trapped in her body. Mm-hmm. Her spirit was there like right away and she was with me and she actually guided me to my to get my. So like my sister, um, came, unfortunately, wasn't in the country when she passed. So she flew down, totally shocked, and she needed clothes for the funeral. She didn't know what to wear because we don't have anything specific we wear in our tradition. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I'm wearing something white. Let's find you something white. And she's like, I know you have this white dress. Where is it? She's like, I don't know. I literally felt the spirit of my mom, like pushing me towards the basement and like some random back corner I've never gone into. Open it. And there's my sisters in some bag at the back of this drawer. And I'm just like... And so that happened. And then I was on our flight to India. I was sobbing. I was so upset. But it was interesting. Before we boarded this flight, there was this little kid. I think he must have been like three. And he was just like playing with me because I love kids. Right. And he was just like smiling. And I was like, oh, so cute. And then on the whole flight, like bawling my eyes out. Mm -hmm. And then um, so at the end of the flight, I feel someone like a little like tap on my on my leg and I turn around and he just gives me this big hug. And the whole flight is watching because I was like a wreck because this was only a few days after she passed. Mm-hmm. And it was just this feeling I had. This feels like my mother saying goodbye. Yeah. Oh, I love that. When my mom was sick, the hospice ladies were coming to help. Hospice talks about that you're a butterfly after you die. Mm. And at the grave site, there was a gust of wind and I had long hair and the wind wrapped around me and wrapped my hair around me. And it was totally my mother. And then a butterfly flew by at the grave site. And I was like, even then as a young woman, I was, thank you so much for showing up and letting me know that, you know, like, I'll be okay, that you're still here. I love that. It was like um, the wind was uh, a ghostly hug and I just loved it. I can totally appreciate that. And so any wind gust could be whatever we want it in that case. And so I'll just assume every time the wind blows, it's my mom giving me a hug. Well, because why not? Their presence is always there. Yeah. Oh, I feel so good to talk about this. Oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, good.